Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Heroes Mindset Podcast. Today, I have on Deborah Ryan, and she is, well, she is somebody who has so many different experiences, so many different stories to tell, and I want to thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this. So the first thing that I want to really dig into, and this is this is probably, you know, I like to frame it in terms of, you know, the origin story, sort of how you got started. So you started out before you became a shaman, before you became a union analyst, before you essentially went on your spiritual journey, you were a, uh, was it a stockbroker? You were a stock analyst. And um, I want to know how you started from, you know, we'll say an ordinary person in an ordinary society to, well, who you were then and then who you became. Well, probably even going back before that, I was a, um, I was a, I worked, I was working writing um, nonprofit or for proposals for nonprofit organizations in Compton and then all mm. of the funding got cut. And so then I was thinking, I've got to find a way of generating income because there's no funding available. And then um, a friend came and visited me. I was living in Southern California. And she had a friend in New York City, and I was ready for a change. And, and she said, well, you could come out and interview for being a stockbroker. And, and I had no business experience. So I went out to New York, and I really I loved the energy of the city. And then um, so I got hired on. And then I sort of fell into being a broker for 10 years. And wow. then but I think there was always a pull for me. I was always drawn, drawn to spirituality. I just actually figured I'd become a stockbroker so I could save up enough money to go to Europe. But then... <laughs> led to another so so when you were let's say before before you even went on your spiritual journey you know were you someone who was a lot more like rational logical you know really sort of the representation of our society today or were you always a little bit more spiritual you know in that in that realm I was I think always a little more spiritual I was a stockbroker during the week and mm -hmm. then I was selling municipal bonds and then on the weekends I was sort of teaching classes on um healing and channeling at the Tibetan Foundation in Denver. And then I realized I really need something a little bit more grounded and anchored, which mm -hmm. is why I went back into psychology, just because I wanted a way of, sometimes things get out, you know, too far out there. And I just, I wanted something that had more substance. Yeah, yeah, no, I like that. You know, one of the best metaphors that I like to use for that is a rootless existence. You know, like often we find ourselves, we have these spiritual roots and we find ourselves, you know, really taken off of them and then you just find yourself you know just lying around doing whatever you know whatever your impulses tell you you know so I do want to ask so what happened after that so after that you went to get your psychology degree and well yeah, things changed I had already had a I before I went in um it was before I was writing non uh, proposals for nonprofit organizations I um I had got my master's and I was working with kids that were um from Compton Oh, okay. And then, um, so one thing led to another. And then when I, you know, I think part of the thing I learned from my experience at the Tibetan Foundation was that I used to have this fantasy that, oh, wanting to go as far out into the galaxy and leave your body. But then what I really learned, and this is, I think, some of what I learned in shamanism, the way you really deepen something is you have to be embodied and you have to anchor it. And then from that, that allows you to have more range. Mm. Interesting. So, so how did you get started with that? So you were a stockbroker, and then uh, first of all, what was the thing that made you quit, right? And then what was the thing that made you, well, you know, start your journey? Um, and then between that, I had started a company because I wanted to do artwork, so I did that for a decade. But I think hmm. I, I was interested. I mean, being a stockbroker was very lucrative, but halfway through it, I just started really hating it yeah you just go to work and say i hate this job and then you know and then you get this whole identity around it and then eventually i just i, I left because i i never really wanted to be a stockbroker i just wanted to kind of acquire the skill set mm -hmm. actually it's it's been useful though because i think i have it's, it is kind of like going into the matrix i kind of have an understanding of what it's like in corporate america and some of the people that i work with um well, actually, a lot of people I work with are in the, in the corporate structure, so it's been useful. Well, I, it informs me as an analyst, but yeah, no, that's one of the things that I find really interesting. You know, like we have, well, our society. So this is one thing that I think will, um, well, I think you'll find interesting. I don't know if you noticed this already, but almost every single piece of you know 
like movie uh, movies or stories or whatever that I really go into. The, the common theme that you find amongst really all of them is that it starts out in a society that is too rational, too logical, right? Too overcome by what you would call, right? The logos. And um, you see that in, you know, that's the Matrix, right? That's Star Wars, that's Harry Potter. You pick a movie and it usually starts out with this, um, this idea that we are possessed by the logos. And the only thing that we find what is real, the only thing that we see as our objective reality is it's the stuff that comes from the mind, the stuff that comes from, you know, the, um, we'll say, objective experience that we could actually see. But what you have found, and this is something that I've found in, in my world, is that real exists beyond the veil of, well, in your, in your, um, in your words, you know, the veil of reality. So we're looking at the world through a sort of, we'll say like a, well, actually I want you to explain it. So the, the best way of asking it is what is real, right? What is the actual reality? And also how does that relate to the veil? Well, I think the veil may be kind of the way I understand it's the difference between consensual and non, um, ordinary, non-ordinary reality. Explain. I kind of think of this in levels. You know, I think there's first the physical, mm -hmm. you know, what we're doing out in the world. It's the concrete, the mundane. And then there's the symbolic, um, which is language and its image. And that was a lot of what Jung talked about with the you know, symbols being sort of the what held the archetypal energy. And then the third level would be the mythic or the archetypal. And that's where you start to see things that, um, you know, where you see these patterns that play out in different cultures. And I think that's where, I mean, Jung would have said that was where the numinous or where the energy comes from. You know, and one of the things that I, I found really interesting when I first started going to Peru is before I went down there, I started having these dreams. Well, I had dreams about snakes. And then I had started having these dreams about these winged beings. And then going down there and finding, I mean, that that is the mythic, you know, it's the, um, the, you know, the snake Amaru, the um, Chokachinchai, which is the jaguar, and then the condor, which is Apuchin. And so all of these things that I had been dreaming about, I started seeing. So, I mean, there is a whole collective piece that I think we start to plug into. And then I think there's something beyond that. And this is really, I don't, this is really where Jung didn't go, but this is what I appreciate about shamanism, which is what I would call the energetic collective, which is when we it's, we start to get beyond the verbal and beyond the image. And I think that's when we get into really more of a somatic experience. And it, I think what, you know, for, to me, what is real is where there's a felt sense of something. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, for intuitives, you know, this was Von Franz's idea, who is a Jungian analyst. She said that, you know, there's, if you look at the Myers-Briggs, you know, we have a dominant function and then we have an inferior function and you know, we have, there's four functions. But whatever our dominant function is, you know, how we relate to the world, you know, like for some of us being intuitives, the, um, the inferior function would be like the sensate, which would be through the body. So, you know, for me, just being able to experience something somatically makes it real because my brain can go in so many different ways, like <laughs> it's sort of a way of grounding it. And then I started to find that's actually what happens in analytic work. Because I think that, you know, I mean, part of this is when people go through whatever they go through, if they go through a state of ecstasy or if they go through trauma, I think both of those states are implicit. What do you mean? Well, you know, I think there's, you know, and I, you know, with trauma, when somebody goes through something that it's so intense, often what happens is it splits off because it's too much to hold in the mind. So the feelings get split off and they get fragmented. And then there's the thinking part and the way people heal really is to go back into that experience of the, of the, of the feeling and to connect the feeling with the narrative. And that's how people work through things. It's not just the narrative. It has to be embodied. Yeah. I thought that was something that was really interesting as you were, as you were going along, you were saying that what is real is something that you can feel, right? Like it's not something that you actually see and you were describing this. So there were points as I was reading your book, by the way, I, all the stuff that I get was from this book that I read from her that it was incredible. It's called Lessons of the Inca Shaman Piercing the Veil. And this was incredible. She has another book that I am definitely going to read because I found this book so interesting. But I, there were points within this book 
where I literally just put a C at -hmm. the top of the page. And for C, I meant crazy. Like literally it changed the way that I looked at the world. And it it was so unimaginative that it was just like that. I literally put it on like a shelf in my brain and said, I'm going to worry about that later because I don't even know how to deal with that right now. One of the things that you were saying, and this definitely gets it back to, um, to your point, you were saying that there was this Jaguar and I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, it starts with a C and there was this Jaguar. Chokachinchai. Chokachinsha, yes. You said there was this Jaguar and he would show up in your dreams and he'd show up in your visions and he would literally protect you from all the spirits and um, and he would work with you. And you said there is something about this that is more real than reality, right? It is, it is literally real. Like you could say this is like a metaphorical figurative Jaguar, but it is actually real. Can you explain that like a little bit to show, you know, explain, I guess, how is it real? Well, I think it's this kind of like what I was just saying. I think there's this felt sense. And, you know, I mean, sometimes with these beings where there's a strong sense of protection or this overwhelming sense of love, that's this, that's so powerful. And I mean, I think most of us find meaning through connection and feeling. Mm. No, I find, I find that something super interesting. I mean, you think of like the traditional way that we look at Christianity, like people say, Well, I think that's the biggest question. You know, people always say God is real, like Jesus really existed, you know, but what I always say back to that when, when people talk to me about that, I'm like, maybe, right? Like maybe existed, but it doesn't really matter if he literally existed, right? Like that doesn't even, it doesn't matter if he literally lived in the objective world, he lives within you, right? That's the God image. And, um, and that's really all that matters. I feel very alien. (laughs) <laughs> yeah no i guess i am because i've been learning a lot from it i think that's real i think that is true otherwise it, i mean what's the point then it's just disembodied yeah no it's true it's true a lot of it is like you know well it just it just changes the way that you look at real so so here's another example that i thought i put a c next to this and this is maybe the craziest thing that that i read in the entire book he said that shaman, right, when they go through their major initiation ceremony, they become cross-eyed almost always, or they often become cross-eyed. They're struck by lightning. Because they are struck by lightning. Yeah, so on differently, but I think I've known maybe four or five Ultima Sayaks, and one of them is cross-eyed. One of them had um, part of their body parallel. I mean, there's things that happen with physicality, which, you know, you know, it's really strange. The oh. first time I was going down to Peru, I was, I was, you know, on the airplane watching a documentary and it was about people who had been struck by lightning. I thought it was so bizarre. <laughs> well, that's, a, that, that's what I noticed. There were a lot of synchronicities and literally as you were going through, you're like a lot of this stuff was synch- synchronicity based. And I was just wondering, you know, especially when we talk about, you know, people who get struck by lightning, right? Are we saying that they literally got struck by lightning? Like, did they, did lightning actually come down? Or is that something like the experience that they, that they had was so intense, so strong that they literally were unable to, you know, like they lost a sense of their being. I mean, I think if somebody was there, they would have seen the lightning. But if you think about maybe what was happening energetically, it was being struck by this enormous amount of energy and, and trying to find a way of containing it. Yeah, that is that is crazy. So tell, give us give us a little example. Give us a story of when you were going through some shamanistic experience or um, or just an experience anytime you're in Peru and you had that feeling of just a tremendous amount of energy that was passing through you and well. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think about, um, maybe it was like first time, I don't know, maybe it was the second time I, I was down there and I was um, I was on a um, one of the mountains, you know, they have sacred mountains. One of, I mean, this was on Waka Wilka, but I was looking over at this range and the mountain was, the name of it is Alan Coma. And I, I was kind of in this meditative state and I was looking at it, you know, you kind of go into this, state where you start to you start to see energy and it blurs but all of a sudden 
it was like I was seeing this huge bird and then there was this download of energy. You know, I mean, that was what was so real as I was, I could feel it in my body and it was vibrating. And I was struck by this, an, this incredible feeling of love. Mm -hmm. And it, it was such a numinous experience that, um, you know, and then I think I, I, when I, after I came back, I was trying to make sense of it. And that's actually when I wrote the book, um, lessons of the Inca shaman piercing the veil because I was trying to find a way of understanding what happened to me because I have this huge somatic experience yeah. I come back in, in, into culture that you know I mean this is not something that we really talk about and I was trying to make sense of it and so I started you know then what I realized that you start to integrate it or metabolize it through dreams and then eventually you end up creating a narrative the narrative is how we can look back and reflect on it yeah. but the, the, the experience is somatic yeah so, I answered so, question with that, but. no you did so I think a, a big question that you know that sort of well I guess I'm struggling to interpret is so now that you have this um crazy experience right you had this crazy experience where you were in Peru and it was almost unable to explain now you have to reintegrate it back into yourself you know sort of your ego and the big question is when you think about it now is it an emotional experience? Is it something that you would say comes from, you know, well, yeah, does it still bring emotion or is it something that you've sort of interpreted in terms of words now or something that in terms of the mind? I mean, I think I can talk about it more in words, although I think when we get into those really um, intense energetic spaces, there really are no words. I mean, we can step outside of it and try to describe it, but th there's no way. I think what has helped me, I think when I came back from Peru, First, I was trying to make sense of it, um, and so I was writing about it. But I also think I was trying to find a way of holding on to it because I, you know, one of the things that you come back from an experience like that, and then you're back in the day where I mean, it was so incredibly lonely, and I was just longing. Yeah. To be, you know, I think there's a lot of things that are written about love and light, but I I hadn't really found that much that was written about the shadow side of it, and mm -hmm. so it was really a struggle. Of, you know, Jung talks about that is, you know, when, when there's this connection, the state of conjunctio, and then afterwards there's in the great or the separation, which, you know, and I, that's kind of what I was describing as re-entry. But I think what happened for me is, you know, after spending years going back to Peru and having other experiences, I started to, it started to ground so I know how to access it. So it doesn't feel like, I think it lives in my heart now. Mm. So I don't have to grab it as much because there's, it, I can, I know how to drop into it. And I think and, at first I was afraid I would never get back there. Interesting. So now when you say, so as you're living right now, as you're experiencing, would you say that you are more in sort of like, you know, so you say there are two sort of veils of reality, right? There's the ordinary reality and the non-ordinary reality, like the spiritual re reality. As you're living right now, are you saying that you're living mostly in the ordinary reality and you can channel the non-ordinary re reality whenever you want? Yeah, I think it's a matter of shifting states. Mm. I think there's a thing that we just, there's a way of dropping down into it. There's a, um, there's a, there's different types of meditation, you know, just like in, in, um, in Quechua, there's so many different words for, to explain love. I mean, I think we have one <laughs> culture, but there's so many different types. Um, and, but they also talk about that with different states of meditation, but one of the states is called chink I, and but it's really moving, dropping into that state of no words. And I think what's so great is that that space between chink and I holds, that is the experience. Oh. Space in between. So, you know, I think a lot of what you do is, is you drop into that. And then from that, then, then you can move into other things. But I am, you know, again, I think it has to go into that place of you know, when you're dropping deep in your body and, and you're sensing in your body and you're not thinking, once we're thinking, we're outside of the experience. Yeah. So that's a good question. So normally when I go through a meditative experience, you know, usually I fail, right? I'm not very good at it. And the problem with me is I get into, you know, it's the same thing that happens for most people before they sleep. You know, you, you try to go to sleep and you say, okay, I should be sleeping. 
I should be sleeping. And you're consciously saying I should be sleeping. And then you can't turn it off because that little voice is still speaking. It's the same thing with meditating. It's like you get, you start to delve into that little level and then your consciousness says, oh, I'm in this level. And then you, it, it knocks you out of it. So is there something special about chink eye that, um, that gets you there? Or is it just something that happens within you that you're able to really like turn it off? Um, I'm trying to think about how to describe it. I think it's sort of like what Carlos Castaneda talks about or what he talked about with shifting the assemblage point. I, I really think of it is, I also think of it, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever gone um, scuba diving. Yeah, uh, no, I have not. Well, there's a thing when you jump off, you know, especially at the beginning and let's say there's, a, um, you know, a lot of um, turbulence on the surface, you know, and you, you can stay up there and try to fight it or I mean, really what you do is you try to go down to the bottom as soon as possible, because once you get down, then it's quiet. Mm. And I kind of think of that, you know, with your, our brains are going a million miles a minute. So you're not fighting this because whatever we're not thinking about is what we're thinking about. But if you can drop down into more of what you're experiencing like in your belly, so you're mm -hmm. not fighting, this is where you're feeling from. And I think that's how we start to move in into those profound states or into our hearts hmm, interesting so how do you how do you do that how do you quiet the mind you know how do you really turn it off um i don't i think you, you don't fight it you just i mean it's doing whatever it's doing mm -hmm. you don't attend to it it's more like you, you know it's sort of like what you're sensing yeah body, it's sort of like with people when they're having panic attacks you know, it's like they, they think, oh, no, I'm going to get, you know, then there's this fear of of going into a panic. But if you don't fight it and just like, OK, well, what am I feeling in my body? All right. I'm feeling some tension here. All right. So you're not fighting it. You're actually going into it. Mm. Otherwise, if we stay in your head, like, oh, my God, I'm, you know, and then it just spirals. But if you can get underneath, it's kind of like diving underneath a wave. No. Oh, that makes sense. So it's more of like integrating it, trying to understand, okay, this is what my body is telling me. I'm not going to try to overcompensate with the mind. I'm going to literally try to integrate my mind and my body. Kind of a hard thing to explain, but it's more, it, it literally is dropping into, I mean, the other thing is, I think, um, is that, you know, if you're moving into a state of connection, like with, you know, I mean, you can do this in nature. I mean, this is, happens being on you know for me being on the mountains in, in, in the mountains in Peru is having this intense um, heartfelt connection and I think sometimes the connection you know once we're in connection we're in the experience when we're thinking we're outside of the experience mm, interesting so so a big part of it and I think this is something that I struggle with the most personally, I think most people do is we get stuck in our heads, you know, like that's, that's literally what anxiety is, is, as you said, you know, anxiety and stress and all those things are, you know, you imagine, let's say, I'm starting up a business. And you know, I've, I've been through something like that in the past, where literally, I wouldn't be able to go to sleep, because I'd be laying in my bed, and my mind wouldn't be able to shut off, I wouldn't be able to connect with, well, I wouldn't be able to turn off, you know, my mind and connect to my body. So, one thing that I found is super interesting that the shamans do, and this is something that I don't truly understand, and maybe you could help with, with explaining this. So one of the things that they do to really like, I guess it's like a short circuit, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, one of the things that they do is psychedelics, right? Like ayahuasca, and they use these psychedelics to really like tear back the veil of reality, right? The veil of, yeah, the veil of reality is probably a good way of saying it. And um and just experience what goes on the inside. So can you ex tell us what your experience with it is and also how, what your sort of theory is on it? Well, um, I have, you know, I've been in the jungle and I've worked with some of the ayahuasqueros. So I had the experience of ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. Now I work with, with the, um, with the Pacos and the Andes which, and they, they sometimes use medicine like um, San Pedro, but it's more, it's not really the, the path. I mean, it's working with coca and it's more about connection. Um, okay. And I think you can go as deep or deeper without the plant medicine. But, you know, I think with the, the things that I got out of ayahuasca was um, when I started to get, you know, I don't like the feeling of hallucinating. I, I just, I find that distracting. Mm. And I think this is when I really understood the idea of shifting. 
about, you know, so there's all this activity going on in your brain and you're seeing whatever you're seeing. But then if you can drop underneath it, you don't have to fight it. You can, you know, and that's what Castaneda was talking about with shifting the assemblage point. But I think the other thing that happens in an ayahuasca ceremony, and I'm a strong believer that ayahuasca should be done in the jungle because it's the spirit of the jungle. It, you know, when you're, people are often bolder <laughs> taking it. <laughs> it I, I think it loses something. But I think, you know, when you're in the jungle, one of the things that in talk, you know, we were talking about um, uh, mythic beings. And one of the things that happens oftentimes is there's this experience, you know, um, early on of being eaten by an anaconda. And at first you'd say, oh my God, that's terrifying. But if you don't, if you drop the attachment to your body, then you become the anaconda. So you're, you, you're, there's a shift that happens. And then you can have the experience of moving beyond that and becoming the elements and becoming the stars and the, you know. Yeah, no. A way of breaking that, you know, and when we're attached to our bodies, just like when we're attached to our minds, I think that's when people start to get really scared because they really, they're like, oh my God, I'm losing myself, I'm being eaten. But, but if you can move beyond that, um, you know, then there's this, there's there going to be this intense experience of connection. Yeah, no, I had, I had this lady named Emerald Wilkins on my podcast and she, um, she had literally like, as you were describing the experience, you said there were three stages of someone who goes through a, um, a hallucinogenic experience. And if they're doing it only if they're doing it right. And, um, I was, I was thinking about Emerald Wilkins. She had this story where she said, she goes, I had to die before I had to feel my body dying and go through the experience of dying before I could move on to the next stage. And that's exactly what you described as being eaten by the snake. And then, um, and then she said she, the next stage was like, she's like, I literally became God. And it was like me and God were one. And it's just, it's incredible. First of all, how you need to, well, everyone who does a psychedelic experience or many people who do the psychedelic experiences go through the same thing. Like I figured there'd be something different that exists, but really most of it's the same thing. And then also just the fact that, well, you have to let yourself die. Like, what does that mean? Well, and you know, this is what I think this ties back to, to you with this idea of dismemberment mm, and, yes. thing is, and how painful that is. And then there's the death and the rebirth and something has to die for something new to emerge. It's, you know, it, you know, I, a lot of times when people have dreams with archetypal imagery, like something is blowing up or the, the end of the world, that is you, that's a, those are archetypal, um, that's archetypal imagery. And that is usually what happens when there's deep change happening. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, you know, you could think of it in terms of, well, I think the best way to think of it is what we were saying before, you know, we live in the minds, right. We live in, um, logic and rationality and we think the objective world is the real world but then right you have to experience the death of that mindset right the death of the fact that maybe maybe your mind isn't the thing that's real and then that allows you to be rebirthed and connected to god you know i think that's i guess that's a universal experience you know maybe another way of looking at this is this idea going back to psychoanalysis you know, there, there's an idea of the persona, which is how we show up in the world, but that mm. is not who we are. You know, like Winnicott talked about the false self and then the true self. Like you a know, mask. Yeah. You know, I've had people, it's not uncommon where people will establish themselves in the world and then they'll be in some sort of distress and they'll come into analysis and they'll say, I don't know who I am. Mm. And that's really true when they get out from under how they're showing up in the world, really trying to get a sense of really who they are. And I think that's something that people, I don't think it's a thought like, oh, this is who I am. I think, again, it's about what they're feeling in their bodies and then they're able to articulate it. Interesting. And then what happens is you're saying they need to shed that persona. They need to shed the person that they're not to finally experience the person that they are. Yeah, I mean, we all have personas because we have ways of showing up in the world but that's the idea of being able to shift it's not being the more attached we are to our persona the darker the shadow is explain that well you know if the persona is our false self or you know working really hard i mean then we're, we're disconnected from ourselves because we're trying to manage the outside world um seligman called it an external locus of control versus an internal locus of control you know if you're managing the outside you're disconnected from yourself once you start you you're connected with yourself then you, um, you're, you're giving up control in the outside world, which can be frightening. 
Yeah, there was this quote that you, that you added from Jung that I thought was really interesting. Let's see if I could find it. It said something about looking into a mirror. It's like the 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 shadow is the reflection that you go that you look into the mirror with or something like that. Actually, I didn't answer your question about the shadow. So, if the persona is how we want to show up, the shadow is other. It's what we don't want to identify with. And you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be bad, but it would be like you know, secretary might have a gypsy as a shadow. It's the opposite of how we see ourselves. Mm. So the more attached we are to this, you know, to the persona, then the shadow is all the things that we don't want to see about, us, about ourselves. So the farther we move away from the shadow, the darker it gets. You know, if we, we all have shadows, but if we can integrate it, then it's like, you know, it's there's a um, Star Trek episode that... Um, and I don't remember the exact one. I've kind of changed it, but there's something that happens and Cap Captain Kirk and the Starfleet are going through this something. And I don't know if they have a storm, but all of a sudden Captain Kirk splits. Mm -hmm. and there's this really sweet Captain Kirk, but he's very docile and he can't run the ship. And then there's another Captain Kirk who's a Hellion and he's running around getting in fights and hassling women. And um, he, he's like having these, you know, dr drunken, <laughs> explosions so the the sweet passive captain kirk can't run the ship mm -hmm. and the one that's over the top that's aggressive he can't run the ship either so then eventually something happens and captain kirk comes back together so he's integrated and and then they go on but we, we need our shadows because it's part of where we get um you know aggression and aggression doesn't it's not necessarily a bad thing but it's you just described Fight Club, like down to the T. Like, uh, have you ever seen Fight Club? Yes, yes. Like literally, you, that is that is literally exactly what happens, right? You have this sort of integration. There's one thing that does bother me, right? There's one thing that really, really does bother me about, well, we'll, we'll say modern mythology, but like just myths in general. So one thing that you talked about, right, and you you refer to snakes as your shadow, right? This this figure of Amaru who's a snake, and you say that yes, you have to be eaten by the snake, and also you started to see your snake as your guide. You know, it was sort of helping you out throughout the journey, and in that case, your shadow. You know, that other part of you was integrated into yourself and helping you throughout the journey. One thing that bothers me is. Well, if we're, we're to look at a snake, a snake is a representation of a natural fear. Like people are naturally afraid of snakes. That is not to be questioned at all. I think there was, I think it was Charles Darwin. What he would do is he would go up to a, a glass, right? And there would be a snake on another end at sort of like a zoo. And, um, and he'd put his face up to the glass and he'd wait for the snake to come in, like come at him, right? And try to bite him through the glass. And, um, and of course he would like shriek and move away and have this sort of fear reaction. And he tried to, well, auto, he tried to habitually get rid of that fear response. So he wanted to literally just keep his face there and have no sort of reaction. And he said, no matter how many times the snake charged at him, every time he automatically moved away, you know? So we have this natural, natural fear of snakes. And we could say that's part of the human shadow, but you integrated this into yourself. I, right now, I'm reading the Harry Potter books, right? And I don't know if you read the Harry Potter books. In the pandemic. Oh, I did you really? <laughs> reading these. Yeah, no, I, I read them over this winter break because I was like, wow, there is something so incredible here that I have not tapped into. And well, it's probably fresh on your mind. What is your opinion on the fact that we look at the snake in this case, right? The snake is a representation, obviously, of Voldemort. And the goal at the end, right, is to kill Voldemort, either Harry Potter or Voldemort wins. And it says in the prophecy, right, one of them has to die. It's not like, you know, you could, there's no concept of integration. There's no way that Harry and Voldemort become one. One of them has to die. So what do you, what do you see in that when you re reference that to something that really contradicts your experience with the snakes? Well, you know, maybe the other thing is, I think Voldemort might have been how Harry Potter started to understand his own shadow. Explain. Well, you know, it, it, I mean, he had, I mean, he had both. He had the positive and the light, but mm -hmm. there was part of him that was also, we had part of Vladimir, of Voldemort in him. And the so, scar. Yeah. yeah. So I think that was, you know, something that 
you know, he was moving away from, but then he realized at some point that was shocking for him that that also lived inside of him. Mm. I think that's maybe the facing the shadow or the integration, you know, and I think there's a thing that also happens, you know, but in Andean medicine, the snake or Amaru is also creation. And you would have said that the snake was the closest, um, that's the instinct, the closest to the instinct. So sometimes when people are dreaming about snakes, it's about embodiment. Um, what was I going to say about that? Oh, so anyway, I mean, that's another way of looking at it in terms of, um, you know, I mean, then that's also, Amara would also be, um, you know, this, the um, mythic figure that's associated with the belly or what, um, or what they would call um, Yankai. That's the yeah. one that's to us. So, but I think they're, but going back to what you're saying in this culture, I think the snake generally is considered evil. Yeah, but, well, that, that's that's sort of the the you know God and the devil are literally two different people, right? It's the same idea. You know, it's really interesting. It's like when you started out talking about logos. If mm-hmm. we're a um, a very cerebral culture, I mean, it would make sense that the snake would be terrifying because it's that's about being in the body. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's something that's. Well, you know, that's that's the characteristic of the Logos. You know, you look at the Logos, he hates everything about the unconscious. He hates everything about everything that is not rational and not logical. So that's that's one of the big problems I have with our culture today. I, and I, I'm sure that's something that you experienced as you were, you know, coming back from Jungian analysis as, as well as your shamanistic experience. I'm sure you realize that, you know, our culture sees these natural impulses. You know, that's something that Joseph Campbell said. He said he went to Japan and they saw every impulse as something beautiful, right? Like, you know, we look so down upon sexual impulse, for example, and sleep, we look so bad, badly upon sleep, upon the desire to eat, you know, desire eat, to eat. We look at it as something, you know, this is only something that unhealthy people do, but then it manifests itself in unhealthy ways. So I guess, I don't know, I guess, is that something wrong with the mythology? Or is that something that um, that symbolizes something that exists be, behind our cognitive framework, something that exists underneath? Well, you know, like what Jung would have said is there was a, um, a light and a dark, and, and this is consistent with shamanism too. There's a light and a dark to the archetypes. You know, everything has a dark side. And I think it's about recognizing it and, and trying to integrate it. You know, it's kind of like doing trauma work when somebody's trying to get out of it. And the more you try to get out of it, the more stuck you are. If you can go into it and experience it and feel it, then you can, that's how you release it. That was one of the craziest things. You were talking about that in your book. You said there was some person who had, I think, was abused as a child. And yes, yes, she was beaten by her stepfather as a child. And you said uh, what you did when you, when you helped her was you literally had to make her go and re-experience that. And that's one of the things that's the scariest when you talk about, I mean, you talk about your husband, Perry, you talk about yourself, you talk about everybody who has some sort of, um, we'll say, spiritualistic experience. Every single time you try to experience the light, which in the case of the trauma survivor would be to overcome that experience, you have to experience some shadow that exists with it. Well, and like Jung said, you have to, it's not about going into the light. It's about taking the light into the dark. Hmm. That's a good quote right there. That's a really good quote. So I got to ask, so you spent a lot of time in Peru, you know, you spent a lot of time with people who in who lived a different culture than we live. What was it like? You know, what was it like in the systems that we normally repress, right? So we'll say, what what was their sleep system, right? Did they sleep like your typical eight hours a day? What was their eating system? What was their system of sex? You know, did they have monogamy? Did they have, you know, did they just sort of act on natural impulses? And what about, yeah, things like smoking, things like, um, you know, your typical eating sensations or mouth sensations. What did they sort of do for that if they didn't repress them? Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Pacos, which in, in the shamans call themselves Pacos. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think they're much more embodied. They talk a lot less than we do. <laughs> They're, you know, I think their diets are a lot cleaner. Um, you know, and I don't think, I mean, I think anything in excess, I would say they're pretty traditional in, in terms of sexuality or 
relationship. You know, sex can be a vice just like um, alcohol or drugs or any of it. So I think, it, you know, for them, sex would be about connection or spirituality. And did they do that through multiple relationships or was it through relationships with one person? I think they form a family in a community. Community and family is really big. Mm. And I think that's, um, you know, there's this idea, you know, whatever you experience on the mountain, you have to be able to take it back to the village and grow corn with it. It, It's like derive value from it. Yeah. Yeah, And being able to bring it back, you know, in shamanism is really an act of service. It's, servicing the the greater it's the it's the numinous you know i mean that's the difference between sorcery and shamanism sorcery is about gaining personal power and shamanism is a is a practice of connection hmm i never looked at it that way that's really interesting so what have you found you know so you i think i think it's really funny if we were to look at you know the experience of the matrix right like or whatever you call it, you know, the, the Toltecs, they call it the dream. They say that we live behind a veil. We live behind a veil of ignorance. We live in a dream. We live in the matrix, right? We live in this reality that is false. And by false, I mean, you know, it's ignorant because our culture is ignorant and our culture is always going to be ignorant, no matter which society we live in. And at the same time, we shield ourselves from reality. So when you say, you know, somebody takes something and puts it on their shelf, somebody takes an experience and that that means they take an experience and they just forget about it because it's going to cause them some sort of psychological harm. So what have you found and as somebody who's seen behind the matrix, you could say? What have you found? How have you been able to well grow corn with it? Well, I think it's like anything. You know, we think we have an understanding of something and then it deeps to, you know, I think it keeps deepening. You know, I think it, again, I think it's like embodiment. But, you know, and I also think sometimes this idea, one of the things I think we struggle with, and one of the things I definitely struggled with when I was in Peru and I, some of the some of the things I experienced, I was thinking at the time, I think I was just finishing up my PhD and I was thinking if I had been describing what I've experienced in one of the hospitals that I worked in, I would be probably diagnosed as being delusional. And so I'm thinking, is this real? This can't be real. Because it was outside of consensual reality. And I think what I've learned with that is those were, but they were powerful experiences. So I couldn't really make sense of it. And I think that's, you know, for me, putting it on the shelf, like not knowing, instead of saying, well, is it, is it not, you know, then you go back and forth and just like, sometimes what you know is you don't know. And I think sometimes the way you develop relationships with this is it, it really is a settling in and there's an integration that happens. But I, again, I think it's, it's through, I'm going to say embodiment again, because I think when we're in our mind and we're going back and forth, it just, it's, it's crazy making. Well, that's one of the, that's one of the things that bothered me, you know, so obviously I spend a lot of time in the hero myth. Clearly, clearly, I really love the hero myth. And um, the problem with the hero myth is something that you just explained, right? If you're operating with the hero, you're operating with your head, you're operating with your ego, you're operating with your values. And the problem with the hero is, for example, let's take a Let's take a war example, because this is something that Joseph Campbell, who created the Heroes Framework, he explained. He says, if you take a soldier who fought for America, you would say that man is a hero because he's fighting for his country, right? But then the problem is you could go on the other side and say somebody who fought for the Nazis was also a hero because he was fighting for his country. And if you were to go for the universal hero myth, both of those answers are right. Because heroism only talks about the process that you go through, the character strength that you develop. It's irrespective of the actual values that you are going to support. So you see that in our political in our political reality right now. You have somebody on the, you know, we'll say blue and red, right, to keep it innocuous. You have someone on the blue side who supports something with all their heart, all their head, you know, and their entire ego is forced to make this change a reality. But then you have someone on the red side who has the same exact goal, same exact, well, the same exact development, right, in the same hero's journey structure, but at the same time, they are literally fighting on the other side of the aisle, and if you have two heroes go against each other, this was something that they talked about in the Dark Knight. They say, what happens when a, when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? 
you have tension, right? And you have irresolvable tension that, that two people that are sure of something, but the problem is one of them has to be ignorant because, you know, yeah. you can't. That's the shadow. They would both be chattels for each other. You know, you know what this huh. I can't remember the which one it is, but in one of the, it's in one of the Doctor Seuss fables. He he talks about these two beings, one's coming from the east, mm -hmm. and one's coming from the west, and they meet, and neither one of them is going to move. So he, the civilizations grow and they fall, and it goes on, and they just stay there because the other one is in their path, and they just don't move. You know, do, did you ever read Doctor Seuss? I never got too big into him, but. <laughs> think about it, that's exactly what we're talking about yeah, yeah. no you know, well, go ahead sorry no i think it's so interesting because then you ask the question you look at these heroes and you say what is the solution right what is the solution and your solution that you propose which killed my heart which really killed my heart but it, it sounds i guess like the right answer is maybe the hero structure is a little bit wrong maybe the fact that we you know the the whole purpose of a hero structure is to develop an ego but you're saying maybe the problem itself is the ego, because when you develop an ego, then you develop strong values, and then you could have two people develop a value. So you're saying the, the solution to that is to not develop an ego, and that's what the shamans do. Well, let me, let me say this from more of a, um, a Jungian perspective. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think we have to develop an ego, because we have, you know, that's the idea of going out and slaying the dragon and, and yeah. separating so you have to go out and develop an ego because you have to have ego so once you've developed an ego i mean that's like the first half of life you're developing an ego because if you don't then it's sort of like you're always in a state of regression and you never really um you, you know you're living an unlived life so you have to go out and do that once you get your ego mm -hmm. half of life it's then it's surrendering your ego to something larger you know jung said victory um, for the self is defeat for the ego so you have to get an ego then to give it up. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. No. There, there's a story that that really reminds me of. It's the um. Have you ever read Nietzsche's um? What is it? The Spurs of Zarathustra. So he, he had this story, and it was it was incredible. He says, um, you know, it's called the three metamorphoses, and it says that when you go through life, you have three different stages of life, and he says when you grow up. Uh, you're a camel, right? And the goal of a camel is just to get information, right? I'm sure you understand the symbolism of the camel. It's literally just, it, you get on your knees as a camel and you say, put a, put a load on me, put some information on me, you know, essentially a child, right? And you, you learn about the world. And then what happens is you walk, the camel turns into a lion as he walks into the forest. And the lion's goal is to fight the dragon, right? And his goal is to fight will say, well, that, that means develop an ego, right? That's literally the Lion King, right? And you must fight the dragon that, um, well, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You fight the dragon that has given you the structure. So let's say like you choose Jung and maybe you really like most of Jung and you're happy because he gave you structure, but then you got to fight off some of it because, you know, some of it's wrong, right? And you have to develop your own individuality, which is obviously the ego. And then he says the third stage is the stage of the child, where you literally just sit there and imagine a new world. You imagine a world that, you know, well, now that you fought off the rules, you fought off the bad rules, now you need to essentially imagine a new rule, you know, imagine a new structure for your life. And this was something that really got me as I was reading your your book, you said, as you were trying to reimmerse yourself into the experience of the ordinary world, you know, as you were struggling to take the stuff as a shaman and grow corn with it, right, or, or integrate it into your experience, you said you literally related it to the experience of being a child. And explain that a little bit. That was, that blew my mind. Well, I, you know, I think, so we, if we start out in a state of innocence, and then we go through whatever we go through, and then, I mean, I mean, also, I think this happens with trauma is that the innocent part that gets wounded. I mean, sometimes we develop the self care system. This is what Don Kelshed would say that it's almost like a, um, he would call it a diabolical self care system. Freud would have hmm. called it for ego. Some people would call it inner critic, but it's sort of like this innocent part was so vulnerable that this other defense system develops to keep it repressed because 
you know, it's like, it, it, it's almost like you have to be hyper vigilant. This is when you go into your mind and move out of your feelings. That's that whole idea, I think, of the separation. And, then, and eventually, when you're working through trauma, this part has to start to shift so that this part can come up because I think the innocent part is really, well, it's where we, we're feeling and that's where we're connected, but that's also our life force. Mm, interesting. That's that's the way that I like to conceptualize it. I like to conceptualize it like a boat. It's like, you know, imagine you were sitting on a boat and you were innocent and things were going really well and then your boat sinks. It's like, what do you do? And um, well, you said that one thing that you were struggling with was there was this, somebody offered to give you like, we'll say like a little wood board that you could kind of sit with and float on. And that's that's literally like the diabolical coping mechanism, right? That's like the little bit of structure that you could use to cover up your experience, which is, you know, you can think of that as alcohol, right? Like some sort of coping mechanism, or like alcohol, maybe eating too much, you know, distracting yourself from the world, something like that. You know, it's just like the little life raft. It'll keep you afloat, but you know, you're not, you're not living well on that little, that little life raft. And, um, and you said it crushed you. That's, that's one of the things that sucks about it. It's like, you know, one of the things that you worry about reintegrating yourself is there's actually the chance that you get lost. Right. And um, did you ever experience anything like that? Well, I think it was really, I think it's, um, and I think some of those things that you're talking about are a way of numbing out where people don't have to go down and wrestle yeah. really painful places. But, you know, I think the part for me about feeling lost was having this other experience of reality and then coming back. And I think we tend to live in a somewhat of an alienated, isolated culture. And I think that was what so, so painful mm. this of connection and then kind of coming back. But then I think what you learn is you can go back and forth. So you don't have to lose that state of connection. And I mean, I think when you integrate it, it's there with you. It's not like you have to, you know, I think I thought I have to go back to the mountain. No, you know, but then you realize, no, you can go back to the mountain, but you can bring the mountain with you. Huh. That was a very profound idea. You said it like it was nothing. I think, I think that's something that, that blows my mind. So you're saying that, So you're saying that you could literally channel the, like you could literally be sitting in a room right now. And, you know, we're both sitting in rooms that are concrete or drywall walls, right? And we're not in touch with nature. We're sitting in air conditioning, right? Like things are, we are very out of touch with the the spiritual realm. But you're saying that you could take the spiritual realm and bring it into the the, the ordinary realm that you're in right now. Yeah, and I do think we do that. You know, you know, I think one of the places where most people connect is in nature. You know, you you know what it's like to walk through leaves after it's rained and what that smells like, or yeah. what earth feels like, or looking at a huge tree or looking at the sky. I mean, those are things. Those are memories or experiences that live inside of us. And I think that's some of. Um, I think that those are things we pull from. And I think there's degrees of it just crazy like that's such a mythological idea and it's it's weird because you never actually see it brew up in real life right like there's this idea of um lion king moana jesus just pick all of them the matrix like all of them what happens is you have a character that dies right think of think of like the Lion King is a great example. The fa Simba's father dies, right? But then what happens is when he's having a transformational experience, his father comes and visits him in the form of a ghost, you know? And well, that's exactly what that means, right? It's the connection with the non-ordinary reality, non-ordinary reality, just it is within you. You're saying it's not something that just exists, you know? Well, that's exactly what you just described. Well, you know, I'm thinking about Star Wars, in the first Star Wars, and then- mm -hmm get struck down and it's you know and it's it, there's this sadness that obi-wan's gone but then he shows up and he on a spiritual level he's guiding luke St skywalker through the when he's fighting the that star yeah huh yeah no that's exactly what happens and it's like well i i find that i find it something super interesting so like for example maybe that's exactly what happens in our ordinary life you know so i was reading a book the other day it was called why we sleep right? And I put the book down and I realized that book is now dead to me. 
but it has integrated itself into me. Like that's the same thing that's happening with this conversation, right? Like this conversation will eventually die and this book, I'll eventually put it on my shelf, but it will, I don't have to read it every single day for it to be a part of my knowledge structure. I literally take it and I integrate it into myself. So also integrate it in a way that's meaningful for, for you you know I, there's a thing that Jung said he said I'm glad I'm Jung and not a Jungian and I think what he meant by that is he could go and have his own experience versus plugging into an algorithm and I think that's what we all have to do is take what you know as they say in 12-step programs to take what fits and leave the rest but but you know I think that's also the idea with even with dream interpretation it has to click for the dreamer and you know, it's that idea of spirituality. It's what's like whatever our truth is versus plugging into organized religion. Mm. Not that religion can't work for people, but I think you know, this idea of individuation is finding your own connection with with the self. Well, that's the problem. I mean, you know, you you just described it. You know, I, I thought you described it well. You're saying that we we struggle to separate ourselves from this from this dogma, right? We struggle, you know, you take something like religion and I bet you most of the Christians that I've met haven't read the Bible, right? They just listen to the people who are, um, who are preaching and they listen to the priest's interpretation of the Bible or they listen to only those select, um, those select passages. But, and that's the difference between being Jung, right? And being Jung would be the person reading the Bible and being a Jungian would be the person who's, you know, who's struggling from the dogma and just is only listening to what the church tells you. And the problem is that, well, it's flawed, right? It's, it's flawed to, you're only, you're only getting sort of like half of the message if you only listen to select points of the Bible. So I think that's really cool. You know, you're a Jungian, right? Like I, I'm sure you still consider yourself a Jungian and you use Jungian practices, but you've separated yourself from that. You fought the dragon and also saying, I'm going to ditch some of Jung's ideas and also connected to shamanistic experience yeah and you know i'm even thinking like if christianity is not my path but you know i think when it works there's this ritual i mean i think ritual is so important because it holds yeah. the experience. and i think when i observe people that are really um where christianity is meaningful i think there's this devotion in this heartfelt experience of connection yeah, well, that's that's one of the things that bothered me. So I was I was raised Catholic, right? I was raised Catholic my whole life. And up until the point where I was about, we'll say 17 years old, went to went to church. I wouldn't say often, but I went through the the CCD and the regular trials. I was, I'll say your ordinary person. And I went through confirmation. And I had no idea that every time I go to church, the body of Jesus Christ is being we'll say pulled for, or pulled from the universe and turned into a living body every single church session, right? Like that is the full meaning behind every single church session. Like you are literally, you're not eating a bread. You're literally eating the body of Jesus Christ. I didn't know that until I was 17 years old. Like I didn't experience that at all. And I find that most of the people that go through that, right? Most of my friends, as I was going through church, we didn't, they didn't know either, right? Like nobody had any idea. And that's the problem. You literally have, you're completely separated from the, the, the mystical experience. And you just literally think you're just eating bread. Well, and that's maybe the thing with the ritual is that it really is. I mean, if you, you know, at least my understanding would be, you're really trying to metabolize it and embody it and, and, and integrate. It. I mean, maybe that's this idea of keeping it alive symbolically what like eating the bread yeah it's sort of like having it live on inside of you hmm, i like that i was talking to um so I, I go to college right and there's a there's a church down there and it's it's like a, a little you know a few blocks from me and the priest he was saying he goes he they offer us food every weekend right and um you know after after church you go down and they they give you dinner and he says you know i i give people regular food so they could have their spiritual food for the week and i i think that's the best way of conceptualizing it well, that's great that's beautiful yeah i think i think that's really cool Let's see if there were any other questions mm -hmm. that i had that were super interesting oh there's this one idea you know that that really um that really gets me. It's this idea of it's so it's it's in Shrek. I don't know if you've ever 
if you've ever seen Shrek, but he has this idea that ogres have layers, you know, like, so the, first he says onions have layers, right? And ogres like humans are like onions. We have layers. And if you peel back the layers, then you finally get to this deeper part of yourself. All I want to understand is what your sort of interpretation of that is, you know, what does it mean to say that humans have layers and sort of explain that? Maybe that's the side. I think there's a couple ways of looking at it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think maybe what you're doing is pulling back the layers of the persona so you get down to the essence of who you are, your true self. And I, I mean, another way of looking at it, I think trauma is layered. And I think as you, you start to peel that back and work through it, I think that's when you get back to the essence of your, you know, the innocence. It's literally like a remembering. Yeah, I must say, as I was reading this, some of the craziest things that I read was, was with your husband, Perry, the struggles and the crazy experiences that he was going through might have been one of the craziest, craziest things ever. Is he doing okay? You know, like it's been 10 years since that, you know, is, is he, well, he, so his story is he, he went through child abuse. And then one day he said, you know, 30 years later, wait a second, I didn't even think about it for 30 years that I've been repressing this child abuse and I've never integrated into my consciousness. And then for five years, he went on something that was probably resembling of something delusional, but, you know, something that you sort of had to let him go through. So what happened with that? Well, you know, I think somebody said what made Jung Jung was a strong constitution. Mm. This is one of the really hard things with individuation or spirituality is sometimes people don't have the constitution to be able to integrate it. Yeah, well, that's that's one of the things that that I worry about. So I was talking to this lady, Emerald Wilkins, and she was one of the psychedelic experience. And I asked her, I said, what should should everyone do psychedelics? Right. Like that was my general question. And I knew that she was going to say no, but I was going to see, you know, how ignorant she perceived me to be. And what, what she said was only if you're ready. Right. Only if you feel like you've gone through, you know, this if you feel like you're strong enough to really, to really make it through. Cause one of the things that scares me is, well, in almost every single mythological lesson, let's see if we could, well, in the matrix, for example, that's a great example. You know, everybody takes the, takes the red pill and well, everyone who's in the, who's in the structure takes the red pill, but there's one guy in there who says, God, I wish I never took that red. I, I Right. Yeah. Like I wish I took the blue pill and just moved on to my ordinary reality. So have you in your, in your psychological experience, obviously as a counselor, have you met people who've gone through this tremendous experience, but then just found themselves lost? Well, I mean, I think that's, I'm quoting you a lot tonight, but I think that's that idea of some people are not candidates for analysis because they don't have the ego strength. And then what, I mean, I think what you try to do is shore people up and not take them apart. I mean, some people can go a death through a death and rebirth, but that's the point of why you need an ego, a strong ego to then get rid of your ego. If you never develop an ego, then there's, then you're fused. You, you, you've never differentiated. And, um, you know, I guess there's another saying in Peru, which I like, I don't think it, everything has to be blasted through. And I mean, that's why I frankly think from my own experience, I prefer the Andean tradition that isn't with plant medicine. There's a saying of slow down to move fast. Oh, what does that mean? Just the idea of sometimes, you know, kind of like we were talking about with embodiment or knowing. Mm -hmm. It's not something, you know, when something is embodied, it takes a while to settle in. Yeah. You know, I think one of the problems, I think this was, I'm trying to remember who pointed it out. Maybe, I don't know if it was Huxley, somebody did about, um, I mean, I don't, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, that sometimes that's a shortcut is that people, you know, back, and I know there's a whole thing now where that this is being reintroduced, and I, I'm not saying there aren't benefits to it, but this idea of sometimes if you can get through your spirituality through your own practice versus taking something artificial, and again, I think that's how you're approaching it and how connected you are. Yeah. I think sometimes fast is not always better. Huh. It's like a, it's like a get rich quick spirituality edition. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. That, that, that makes sense. It makes sense. You know, I imagine it, I imagine psychedelics like that. I imagine it like layers. Right. And I imagine if you're, imagine you have like seven layers, right. And you've only peeled back the first two. 
If you take psychedelics, you're probably screwed because you're going to have to confront three, four, five, six, and seven at the same time. And it hits you all at once. So, wow, that's an interesting way of putting it. So then, so then you're saying what happens is people get lost. You know, if you've ever seen the movie Inception, that's really what happens. Yeah. Like, you were, yeah, like the, the lady, right, his wife, Leo DiCaprio's wife, literally just like she had this crazy mythic experience and she literally couldn't find her way out of it. I imagine that's that's why people look down upon the hippies in the 60s and 70s. I obviously was very not much not born then, but I imagine that too many of the hippies, too many of the, um, too many of the people who took these psychedelic drugs probably didn't make it back. And that's, that's probably what happened. I really just... From what I've seen, I think you can reach those states of ecstasy without drugs. And again, I know it's it's been useful for some people, um, but I think everybody has their own path on the way they approach things. Hmm. No, that's something that's something really interesting. And so it seems like you wouldn't recommend it. So yeah, I mean, I I, I see a lot of people who are who are in very different camps on this. So yeah, it seems like your recommendation is don't do it. Try to do it yourself. And especially as a, as a psychoanalyst, it's probably a good way of putting it. I think that there's some positive things about that. And I know people are have there's some benefits. And I think, you know, like with some of what's going on with microdosing, I think, you know, I think there's some people are, it's, it's helpful for some people. Mm-hmm. It's not how I approach it. I don't, I'm not saying people shouldn't do it, but, you know, I think we all have ways of doing things that resonate. All right. No, I like that. I like that. I mean, usually, you know, when you speak to people about it, people always talk about the mystical, but as you said before, you know, nobody really informs you about the shadow. Nobody really informs you about the downside of, well, I guess pursuing your dreams in in the most literal sense possible, you know, like doing something like that, it could really, well, it could get you stuck. I think that's a great way of putting it. So, um, Yes, I think everybody, everybody should go and read this book. This was an incredible book, Lessons of the Inca Shaman by Deborah Bryan. And um, well, is there any place that people could find you, any new material that people could get from you? And also, you know, um, any final lessons that you think we should take from this? Um, Yeah, a lot of what I'm doing right now is I'm I'm writing. I've been, most of the writing I've been doing lately has been more psychoanalytic and then I'll refer to shamanism, but I kind of blend them together. I mean, some of what I'm working on right now is a book on time. I mean, I think that's one of the things that was so interesting to me, you know, with this whole shamanic experience is getting outside of, you know, um, temporal reality. Time space can team because I think one of the things that happens when you're in a state of ecstasy, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. No, it's okay. This is interesting outside of time where everything's happening at once. So that's been something I've been really curious about. And I guess maybe what I'm continuing to do is trying to find a way of really integrating it more into, you know, what we do as analysts. It's finding other ways of growing corn with it. (laughs) Interesting. So um, definitely when you publish that book, it will be down below or any articles related to it. And I know that there is a second book about, um, about, the lessons from the Inca shaman, which will all of these books will be down below. So Deborah Bryan, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you.